Hey, good evening, folks. Thanks for those of you who have joined. Uh, we're going to give it a few minutes before we get started. Um, we're going to go through just a little bit of uh, information at the beginning, showing you how everything works on the screen, uh, and then we'll get into the demo. Uh, if in the meantime, while we're waiting, you have questions you want to share, you could go ahead and send them in the chat and we'll just kind of ad hoc answer some questions as they come in. Uh, and then once we get to a little bit more of a critical mass, we're expecting about 75 to 100 folks, we'll, we'll get going. <clears throat> I guess if folks haven't seen it, there should be a control panel. At the bottom of the control panel, there's a chat function uh, and you can type questions in that chat. Uh, that's also the process by which we will take questions uh, during the webinar itself. So we'll begin in a few minutes. Should add some uh, hold music, Joe, or something to. <laughs> you want me to start singing? I don't think you yeah. want to do that. If you got a good voice, go for it. No. Hey, good evening. Thanks for those of you who have joined. I see we've got a few more folks that have joined. Uh, we're going to give it a minute to let folks uh, join the call, and then we will um, get going uh, with the introduction and then jump into the demo and then do some Q&A. Uh, <laughs> I did want to let everybody know that the, um, the webinar itself is being recorded because we're going to be sharing it uh, through um, uh, some of the subreddit and social after. Um, and if you have any questions while we're waiting, uh, there's a chat function. I think Jay just sent a chat out to everyone. Uh, if you have questions, feel free to type a question in the box there and, and we'll you know, kind of ad hoc answer a few questions while we're waiting for folks to uh, join. We'll give it one more minute and then we'll get started um, here shortly. All right, well, thank you for uh, joining us this evening. We've got uh, hopefully some, some interesting content for you. Um, we're gonna be talking about um, setting up a golf simulator. We're doing some Q and A. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Joe from Ace Indoor Golf for providing our uh, expertise on doing the demonstration and answering all the questions. I've known Joe for a while and he's got some just, you know, tremendous experience in the space and, and really wanted to thank him for his time. Today, um, I'm going to run through a few logistics before we get going, um, and then we will just jump right into the demo. And uh, again, if you have questions, you can use the chat function, and we'll try to get to as many of those as we can. 
Um, I did want to start um, by letting everybody know that we are recording. So if you don't want to be recorded, um, you know, maybe not type in a message. I don't think we have anybody, uh, any faces will show. Um, I'm going to go through and give a, a quick tour of the um, go to webinar functionality so you guys can get the most out of the session today. Um, I'd ask everybody to please mute. I think we have everybody muted, but if you would just double check to make sure that you're muted so that we don't have any uh, interruption uh, of some of the information that Joe's gonna be sharing uh, with us. And again, if you have any questions, please use the chat function um, in the uh, control panel. So quick introduction about the presenters. I'm Reed Colson. I'm the founder of yardstickgolf.com. We do all kinds of reviews. I've been writing and researching uh, about golf simulators and home, uh, both home and commercial applications since about 2012. And I run the um, golf simulator forum on Reddit with about 17,000 members. Um, Joe, I'll let you go ahead and introduce yourself. My name is Joe Neumeyer with Ace and Nordolf. Uh, I've been in the business since 2005. I started off uh, as an installer at About Golf. Previous experience was running nuclear reactors in the, in the Navy. So I started off hands-on to get to know the business, did it for a number of years, and then worked uh, up in the director of uh, operations. And so a lot of experience in the materials, uh, designs of simulator spaces. Um, we've, we've ran a couple indoor centers. I've owned it, started Ace Indoor Golf back in 2012. Um, kind of grown a lot over the years and um, up to about 25 employees. We handle um, a lot of the Similarities you see in a lot of commercial spaces such as PGA Tour Superstores, Worldwide Golf Shops, Vive Iron Golf. Um, a lot of those materials and designs actually come from, from our facility and uh, we're here to help. Great, thank you. And I think Trevor's not gonna be joining us today. Yeah, Trevor's doing a, a show in Las Vegas and could not get out of it, so. Uh, so real quick before we get going, I think I asked everybody just to make sure you're on mute. If you go in the GoToWebinar viewer, you should see something at the top that either says, um, you know, who's presenting or, or view everyone. If you click on view who's talking, um, you will just see the presenter. That'll give you probably the most screen for when Joe is doing the demo. So I'd suggest if you haven't done that already, uh, go ahead and do that. And then uh, again, double check to make sure you're on mute. And then if you have any questions, uh, please use the chat function. Uh, what we have teed up for today, uh, you know, we're gonna try to hit as many of these as we can. Folks are really interested in how to, you know, hang or tighten an impact screen, how to pad an enclosure, um, how to deal with interference from metal frames, uh, questions about residential and commercial simulators. Um, and so we'll try to get to as much of those as we can. And so without any further ado, I'm going to stop sharing and uh, go ahead and turn it over to Joe. And we'll start with, um, you know, his thoughts on, on hanging an impact screen. Yeah, so what I want to say first is I know there's many, many different ways to hang a screen. Um, what I'm going to share with you tonight is how we have hung screens over the last 18 years. Um, Conservatively speaking, I think there's probably around 10,000 screens plus in the market that have been, been designed and installed um, by either myself and uh, our, my guys at when I was with Ace and uh, where I'm with Ace and with previously with About Golf. So one of the things, you know, there's two different ways that I see most often about hanging screens. Um, I prefer using the full width of the room if you have it and using two by four lumber and angle iron. Um, I also know that there's EMT and conduit that we'll go over separately. So how we design our screens here, um, this is our signal piece high Q screen. It's a three ply screen. One of the things that sets us apart and I've noticed a couple of our companies actually doing it now as well. Um, we actually use some, some um, webbing on the sides for reinforcement. And a lot of people use some type of canvas material or, or some type of vinyl. And then we also have some Velcro here on top of the webbing that's on the back. 
the other thing that we do that I think is crucial of hanging the screen properly is we use number four grommets, which are just a little bit bigger. Um, you can actually get a cable tie through there instead of like just a some type of cord. How I like to do a screen, um, so what I do is whatever interior width I have, we usually minus three inches um, for a gap. That leaves the proper tension. So you don't want to do too big because then you're going to be right up against whatever you use, whether it's the angle iron or EMT. So once you're up against it, it just it's real loose, it's floppy, it gives. I know a lot of people like to use mattresses behind there, but in all of our installations, we're anywhere between eight and 12 inches off the back wall, um, and we never have a problem. So the screen screen stays tight, and but it's just it's taut enough or well, the ball hit it, you know, just bounce down. There's no there's no bounce back or trampoline back. The other thing is if it's too small. You have to stretch it, you tighten it, you tighten it too much, and that's when you get the bounce, the bounce back from the ball thrown right at you. So how I like to hang a screen is I prefer having grommets and I use cable ties on all corners. Now this is a little, this is a demo screen that we use. So usually it's, it hangs about two to three inches of gap on either side. Um, so I hang it loosely up top. And what I do is I come down to the bottom I go very, I go very bottom of the floor, okay. And then we have a pocket here um, that we sew in, and we use shot cord. So what that does is it keeps the screen tight. So if it lifts up, it flops right back down. So a lot of times you'll see them; those they're squirrely, they don't, they don't sit right, or they're up, up above, or you get a lot of screen on the, on the floor. So this, this shot cord. In this pocket, we put it about three inches. You can't kind of see the gap here, but there's three inches in front of the actual uh, plane of the screen. And what that does is just it just holds it. So hang the two tops, come down the bottom, and make sure this this bottom. And I always use cable ties for the four corners. Okay, that gets it tight. That sets your screen uh, evenly in the space here, evenly up top, and more importantly, flush with the flush with the floor. At that point, I just use bun bungee ties to just go, you know, I just put it right through the grommet, come up here, and put them in the angle iron. So it automatically actually centers the screen, both right to left, top to bottom. It's perfect tension to the point where it's not pushing too far back, where it's a nice smooth screen. It's always going to be smooth. You're not going to see the ripples and stuff like that. And it also is not tight enough to uh, prevent the, you know, to have the bounce back. And then how we do the fill in the gaps, um, we use what we call carpet pads. So this is actually um, marine carpeting that we lay over. So this Velcro right here, this is an actual loop type uh, fiber. So it actually sticks to the Velcro. Let me put Velcro here on the frame. And then it literally just lays down, lays here. Um, over here on this side, I'll get it. We have some two inch foam padding that will actually just lay on top of the carpet here. Let's say, and then that protects, that protects all your angle iron, your wood. And also this carpet right here actually gives a nice even um, picture. So the only thing you see, like a TV, you see the picture and then you see black all around it. So it's, it's pretty much doubles as a movie screen if you want to as well. Um, now projectors, this is one of the things that I get asked often. People start with a projector and say, hey, I've got a projector, now what screen do I got? One of the things I will tell most people is, is the projector should actually be the second thing you actually worry about. First, you need to worry about how big is your screen? And by how big, what I really mean is the viewable image. Um, depending on the width and height of your screen, you'll either be a four, three aspect ratio, which is like an older TV, tube TV, or the newer ones, which are all 1610 by, you know, or 169. Um, once you figure out your viewable image, next thing you need to do is figure out where you're gonna place your projector. All of our designs actually have the projector behind the golfer. Um, I see a lot of people, you know, on the floor, I'm not a big fan of the floor mount unit, although I understand that there's times you need to do it. In that case, you're obviously gonna have a short throw. Um, but typically with 
a nine and a half, nine foot ceiling and above, you can actually get behind the golfer. Uh, one of the things we do is we provide design prints uh, with a layout of the space and exactly where the projector hangs. We use a model of a six foot golfer and then we have the projected image go on the screen. So you can always get, for the most part, behind the actual golfer with the projector. Um, throw distance is one of the things that a lot of people don't understand. And most of the projectors we use are, we use a lot of Panasonic laser projectors. Um, throw distance is somewhere around 1.09 and above. What that means is, so if I have a viewable image of say 100, 100 inches, um, simple math, and my throw distance is 1.09. So what I do is I got to times the viewable width times 1.09, which is obviously 109 inches. And that's where your projector lens needs to be or further back to fill up that viewable image. Some of the other features um, that I like on a projector or cornerstone capabilities. So if it's offset, I mean, a lot of projectors who don't have that, if you're not dead straight on, you get a trapezoid effect and it's not dead square. So um, um, cornerstone capabilities are pretty important in the projector as well. So, doing a lot of talking here. Do you want to flip back to the some of the other questions I can run through them? Sure, just a second. Let me uh, share screen and we can share some of the uh, other questions. You want me to go over the radar metal frames? Yeah, are you able to see the questions now? Yeah, so I mean, like I said, one of the things, so on our website, we do have resources of, of how to hang a screen. So everything I'm saying here is actually we have how to videos at uh, Ace and Their Golf and Give Me Simulators. Um, basically how to how to hang a screen. We provide consultation of how to match up a certain projector to a certain screen size, whether it's again, 1610 or 43, where it's gotta be mounted. Those things will actually dictate what projectors can and cannot be used. And quite frankly, sometimes, you know, depending on the the layout of the room, you can't use certain projectors. So it's always best to figure out screen size, where you can mount the projector to make sure it doesn't get hit. That's important, obviously. And then at that point, you can figure out what kind of projector. Um, metal frames interfering with radar-based systems. So this goes back a long time to the original flight scopes way back in the day that were used in a, a number of uh, golf simulator systems. So there are some companies, I don't have the name of it right off the, my, off the top of my head, but there's some foiling that you can put wrap around metal frame systems that will actually bounce back to radars. It'll prevent it from, from uh, interference. The other thing that people may or may not be aware of is lighting in the space um, could also cause it. And by that, I mean the ballast. So if you have if you have some type of ballast, a magnetic ballast within your light, you need to switch it to an electronic ballast. Those magnetic ballasts within certain types of lights actually pulsate. Um, that's why you see lights kind of pulse a little bit. So those those magnetic ballasts will pulsate and actually interfere with the, uh, the radars. So maybe I'll hit you with a couple other ones, Joe, that came from uh, from the forum. So one of the things that came up several times is any advice for people with you know smaller spaces. So if you you don't necessarily have a large space to be able to set up the simulator, um, you know what kind of things, tricks, tips do you have for folks who are trying to get uh, a setup with a smaller space? Yeah, I mean we do at this point nowadays with all the technology, um, floor mounted units in particular. For the most part, if you can swing a club in the space, you can do something. So whether that's a, a net system, like a net return, um, you can still put a screen system in there. You're probably gonna, you probably wanna go as close as seven to eight inches off the wall. But if you do that, you have to make sure you hang it properly with the proper tension to prevent the, the ball bouncing back into the wall. Um, radar obviously will not work in a, I think the, the, the question was somewhere around a 10 foot wide by 15 foot depth room is probably a, a small size room. Um, so with that said, I mean, screen systems most likely gonna be a four, three aspect ratio. 
system, going to need a short row, um, like a SkyTrack, a, a Foresight Quad, and those types of units that are mounted that are on the floor next to you, those are the systems that you're pretty much going to be relegated to in, 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 a, in a small space. But they're definitely doable. Gotcha. Um, we also got a number of different questions around, you know, commercial applications and, you know, a couple different angles here were, one, um, do you need any sort of unique commercial licenses for any of the launch monitors or simulators or anything special that folks need if they're going to be doing a, a commercial space? And then a second question is, you know, um, is GS Pro uh, an appropriate um simulator software for a commercial uh, solution? That's a pretty wide question, so. Yeah. Um, so mainly the two, we work with a bunch of people. So TrueGolf, Foresight, Unicor, um, we actually we do work with TrackMan. So they're all different, obviously. Um, as far as the commercial license, there's, there's, they do have some commercial suite software licenses i know e6 is, has a commercial suite license um that you pay i think it's like around 1800 bucks to basically manage all the simulators in a multi-simulator environment software software wise um there are subscriptions as you all know a lot of the i mean some of the ones that we've been doing recently a lot of people have been actually leaning towards uh the ixos with unicor price point and they're pretty good systems I usually tend to pair it with E6 Connect, um, which generally speaking is 600 bucks a year for the expanded license where you get all the, all the courses. So, but that's the same price you would pay if you had a residence. So most of them don't have a specific software license for a commercial. It usually pertains to both commercial and, and residential, but you know, it, Again, there's so many different technologies out there. One thing I will tell you is you're probably going to be happy with most of them. Most of the similar companies will tell you that theirs are the best and everybody else is the devil. Um, simply not true nowadays. All the systems, they're just good. I mean, whether it's Foresight, whether it's TrackMan, whether it's TrueGolf. I mean, TrueGolf's coming out with a new Apogee. I've seen it. It's very nice. Uh, eventually, they'll be coming out with some new upgraded software that's extremely good. Um, better than E6 Connect. Um, GS Pro, GS Pro is a great, that's good software. It truly is. I, I played the other day at a buddy's house, um, played Pebble Beach. I've not used it in a commercial setting at this point. The only, th you know, mostly it's uh, E6 Connect and, and Foresight and TrackMan's own proprietary software. But um, I can tell you that just do your research. Um, Figure out what's best for your space, what kind of customers, whether you're going to have um, multi-sport. Not a really big fan of multi-sport in, in in golf centers. You need to figure out what your what your um, what you're going to be. So, are you going to be a golf center? Are you going to be a family entertainment center? If you're a golf center, I will tell you that it's best to have some type of entertainment versus game improvement. Um, well, a combination of both. The commercial centers in years past were seasonally um, operated. A lot of people used to shut down in the summertime, but the game of golf is so popular right now and all the PGA pros are getting behind the simulator market. Um, as a whole, the simulator market in the US in 2022 is about 1.3 billion. And they estimate that the simulator market in 2030 within the US is gonna be north of 3 billion. So it's becoming very popular. You know, there's games like Pin Seeker that you can go in there, you can do contests, you can put down money, you can win money. I expect that to uh, be pretty popular here in, in, in the near future. Awesome, thanks, that was very comprehensive. Um, one of the other questions we got, I think somebody must've been looking at your website, wanted to learn about the simulator rental program. Yeah, so that, we're very careful about renting simulators nowadays because the price points have come down so cheap. Um, usually what we did in years past for golf courses or established businesses is, you know, a golf course, obviously, especially in the Northern market where we're located would have 
potentially a six month season during the winter time where they had no revenue. So what we did is we worked with facilities, we worked with bars where we would actually come in and provide a simulator for, we'd set it up in a banquet room, we set it up in, in, in a space, I've set it up in pro shops where we allowed them to actually continue to have revenue throughout the winter and not have to really lay people off and get people into the club. And then we have our event rentals, trade shows, you know, birthday parties, you name it. We, we come and we actually bring a, uh, a full frame system. Typically, we use a uh, Foresight quad with that, closest to the pin contest, long drives, et cetera. Okay, looks like we had a question that came in through the chat. What's the best for ceiling padding right now? I'm using padded carpet squares, but I get a lot of bounce back. This is in a basement area. Yeah, so you're going to get bounce back. So these are actually, you can't really see it, but these are some panels that we have right now that we have on the wall. Um, whether it's a wall or a ceiling, these are, you know, these panels that we have are four by eight. Um, I'll let you see it from kind of floor to ceiling. Um, but I, I, on ceilings, what we tend to do is we actually what we call use ceiling baffles. Um, most of the carpet squares that you have have a natural kind of a carpet material, as you said, which is really a loop material. Um, so we have Velcros that we use. We use a, a, a kind of a heavy duty material called Starfire, and then we put a two inch row of Velcro we sew on it. So we actually place multiple rows along the ceiling side to side and what they do is when you hit a, a high shot, it actually hits the baffle, doesn't get to the ceiling, and it just drops it straight down. So, I mean, there's really no way to cushion it enough at those ball speeds to, to really get it to drop down unless you use some type of ceiling baffle. You can either do a baffle where you just velcro it right on, it hangs straight down. We've done what, what we refer to as Arabian baffles, where you just hang it and you loop it and you, and you velcro it again. But uh, those are the ways that we prevent the ball from hitting the hitting the ceiling, hitting the screen, and basically really flying back at you. Uh, we had somebody ask if you could repeat the light specs. I think this is related to the interference where you're talking about the ballast. Yeah, so in um, fluorescent lights, the way the the tubes are, you see the you can see kind of the lights kind of flickering back and forth. There's a ballast in there that is either magnetic or electric, electronic. So you don't want the magnetic ballast. So basically you can go in there, you can swap it out for electronic ballast. Um, a lot of the lights that we use nowadays, we tell people to get non-flickering LED lights. Um, if you'll notice, if you ever have some type of, for those people who have video analysis cameras, um, two things that will help if you, have, if you have a DLP projector, you might notice sometimes that you get like a pulsating light in the background of your cameras. So two things, one, you cannot use a DLP projector bulb. You have to use a what they call a three LCD, which Panasonic's, um, there's some E-keys, there's a, a few of them that make it. Um, and then the LED lights overhead, they can actually get a bulb called a non-flickering LED. So those two things will, will help with uh, like video analysis cameras as well getting the kind of the pulsating lights within the cameras. Gotcha. Um, thanks. We uh, got another question here. I don't believe my ceilings will be high enough to swing woods. Um, was going to put up a simulator anyway to do wedge and iron play. Uh, do you know of any courses that have a, or any simulator packages that have a good number of par three courses? Hmm. I don't think a lot of them have par three courses. I mean, so they all have some par three courses, but very few of them have a par three courses because they tend to render courses that people know and want to play. So those are the courses that people will pay for. Um, I know at some at one point True Golf had one, I believe Foresight had one. Um, the GS Pros, the, the golf clubs of the world, when you can make your own golf course, I'm sure they have some. But for the most part, people don't want to really come into like a facility and play. If you want to have a par three course for, for practice purposes, a lot of the software nowadays allows you to pick a par three and then you can put it in practice mode and you can just play par threes all day long and, and work on different shot shapes and, and different uh, yardages as well if you want to shoot into a green on an actual hole. How, how often do you find the... Sorry, go so, ahead, Joe. Yeah, let me answer that question real quick. Ceiling heights. Um, 
the only time that ceiling height ever pertains to is overhead technology. Most of the technologies need to be nine feet or above to work with the overheads. Some of them need to be nine and a half and higher. What I tell people, I got a top 50 instructor right now that I'm working with closely. His ceiling height is uh, is right at nine feet. So the only thing I would tell you is go swing. Swing a club and figure out if you can do it. Um, the technology, you probably have to get some type of floor technology, whether it's a like a Mevo or a track band if it's radar base or some type of floor unit like a like a quad GC3, Skytrack, etc. Um, and then the only way you're going to find out is if you go and swing. But that should not prohibit you from actually u utilizing technologies. Gotcha. We did have something come through to us that you can set par three T's on most G Pro, GS Pro courses. So perhaps maybe turning each of the uh, holes into par threes that way. Um, next question was, how often do you typically have to replace the turf, including the hitting strip in a commercial facility? So the turf should never have to be replaced. Um, some, I've seen multiple different designs in, in commercial facilities. How we do it here is, we use what we call tatami tiles. They're soft rubber floors. You see them in gyms and stuff like that. Um, we use around an inch thick, and we put them throughout the whole the whole floor within the similar space. We use a quarter inch piece of turf, so the total depth is an inch and a quarter. And then we have a we have a material right here. Right here. So we have a material hitting strip that is an inch and a quarter thick. So what we do is we, we'll take a four by eight piece or four by 10, somewhere in between four by eight and four by 10, and we'll actually cut it out and recess it right into the floor. So you're, you're standing on, the, on this piece of hitting turf, you're hitting on this piece of hitting turf, and then once it wears out, you actually just replace it. Um, the turf itself, you really should never have to replace. Now what I do see is people actually standing on the turf and then they have, they'll put like a 12 inch by 36 inch piece of hitting turf in the middle. They'll recess it in. And those are the only times that I see where people actually have to replace the turf. Um, the turf itself is much more expensive than a, than a hitting mat like I just showed you. Um, the other thing I see with wear on turf, which is why I'm not a fan of standing on the turf to hit is people for whatever reason will wear their soft spikes into a commercial facility because they think they get traction. Um, obviously when you're twisting with spikes that'll actually rip up the turf and make it wear much faster. So if you if it, if you're in there with tennis shoes, which typically is good enough to swing a golf club in, indoors, you really should never have to replace the turf. Only the hitting strips. Now if you're replacing hit, hitting strips on a on a frequent basis, that's a good thing because that means you're making money because you got people in there playing. Um, let me look here. I guess for the wall pads, um, would drapes work? Yeah, so we drapes work fine. But with that said, they have to be kind of heavy. Obviously, if you have light drapes, like a light fabric, and you're within inches of the wall, you're still going to hit the wall. So we use uh, kind of heavy, dirt, heavy duty curtains. Um, there's a material called PR20 that uh, we also make curtains out of. It's a heavy, it's basically a black screen material. Um, so we, we get it, we hang it, and um, it's heavy enough. We typically place curtains, heavy duty curtains within probably four to five inches of walls, and we never have a, we never have a problem. But we do a lot of curtains because of just configure garages are a great space to have a curtain because especially with a two car garage um, in spaces that are wide. So we see a lot of curtains like ceilings, ex I mean windows, et cetera, where we just will just curtain it off instead of filling in the, you know, making them fill in the window area. I got another turf related question. What are some options for putting under turf in the simulator? I'm wondering if this might be related to uh, either cushioning or um, getting it level with other other uh, with the hitting mat. So be curious on you know what you've seen folks doing uh, in terms of putting materials under the turf. Yeah, so like, like I said, I mean, I've seen people use foam, like styrofoam, literally. Um, I'm not a huge fan of that because it's very stiff. 
So unless the floor is very accurate, you're gonna get a little bouncing. I've seen people use plywood. Um, like I said, one of the things, we call them tatami tiles or soft rubber floors. They, they will self-level essentially, especially when you lay the turf on. Uh, it's, it's dense enough that you won't feel too, too squishy, but it's also soft enough that you can walk on and feel absolutely fine. Um, again, you know, depending on what kind of hitting mat you use, yeah, a lot of times we put turf right on right on the floor, and then we'll lay some type of mat. You know, whether it's a kind of a rubber mat system, um, we're actually designing our own our own mat system right now. That you, it's a, it's going to be a plastic tray system, and then you inlay um, whatever hitting piece of you know whatever mat you want to use the hitting mat. What do you do to keep a hitting mat from moving on, say, a concrete floor? I usually tap on. So, I mean, depends on the mat, right? So, if you have a rubber mat, um, if anybody knows the kind of the rubber, rubbery stuff that you use for uh, like kitchen cabinets where you put it down, you prevent stuff from moving inside, that stuff, if you actually put it underneath a rubber mat, and whether it's on concrete, so concrete, concrete's okay. There's enough friction in there, you know, it won't, it won't move. It's a rubber mat. Plastic obviously will slide. Um, real fine, real fine carpet that slides. But typically on, our, on, a, on a on a concrete floor, if we're worried about sliding, I'll actually just tap con it in. So I'll use somewhere between you know about two and a half inch tap cons. I'll just hammer drill, hammer drill into the concrete. Obviously, if they got radiant floor, you got to be extremely careful about what, the, what your depth is, or you might not even be able to drill into it. But usually, I just tap con it four corners, and that that'll prevent it from moving. Now, I've heard folks using double-sided carpet tape. Do you feel like that isn't um, a good answer? That's enough. Yeah. If you're if you're not going to use a tray system, if you just want turf or a hitting mat on the floor, then yeah, we can you can either adhere it. You know, a lot of times we'll adhere it, but obviously it wears. So other than that, we use, but, but if you're going to use double-sided carpet tape, I'd highly recommend going to a, like a commercial, commercial grade uh, carpet store and actually getting some very good um, double-sided carpet tape. Gotcha. Um, yeah, next one question here is interesting. So I'm just starting out and I don't have enough budget to build a full-blown simulator initially. Which purchases would you prioritize and then how would you build out over time? I would prioritize launch monitor, um, especially if I mean if you're if you just want to go in there and play with your buddies, you don't care about accuracy. I mean they're all pretty accurate nowadays. Um, if I was going to do something on a on a on a, on a budget, I'd work, I'd get a launch monitor. You know, my buddy of mine just put a Mevo Plus in with GS Pro. I love it. Um, and then I would probably just hit into a net system for now. Uh, I'd get a net return or something like that. What I would do is I'd just hook up a computer to the, to a TV. If you're right-handed as you're facing, I'd put it off to, 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 to the wall to the right as you're facing the net. And then I would hit and I'd look up and just see my shot on, on, the, on the TV. It's probably the cheapest way to go about it right now uh, if you're just starting out. You know, a projector, a higher-end launch monitor, a full-screen system, and obviously that can get expensive, for, but for a budget, I would um, I'd probably start off with some type of net and hook up my computer and software and launch monitor to just a TV and watch it on the TV. Will the uh, viewing uh, experience or the full experience on an eight foot wide enclosure be okay? Looks like the uh, person has 10 foot of vertical space or is it important to have enough width to support at least a 4.3 display? Well, I mean, you can support a 4.3 display no matter what. It's just, if you have eight foot of width and a 10 foot height, you're gonna, you're just not gonna have height, right? So, I mean, if you minus, you know, let's just I mean eight foot, 96 inches, 4.3 aspect ratio, you're gonna be around um, 72 inches in height or so. That's, you know, obviously it's a six foot person. So you're just not gonna have much viewable image. Um, and quite mean, it's enough. You're seeing it, and it's obviously better in the TV. The image, I mean, it's not going to be what, you know, I don't consider that HD because, I mean, once you get to 169 or 1610 aspect ratios, that's kind of high def. Um, just make sure you get the right projector uh, with the right throw distance to not create a shadow. Um, again, you know, 
here at our company, we offer free 30 minute consultations to, to go through all your different scenarios. Our process, quite much as we just talk about it right now, um, we got a full sales staff, full design team, full install team, full production team, et cetera. So what we do is, you know, when you call, what we like to learn about is kind of what you're looking to do. Is it, is it, is it practice? Do I want to, you know, go from a 15 handicap down to a five? Do I just want to have my buddies over and drink some beers? Um, play some good courses. So we'll go through all that. That will help determine kind of the technology um, in your space. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll have you take pictures of the space, maybe a video. We'll go through some measurements. Um, sometimes your space will dictate what technology you can and cannot use. And often it does. Um, and then what we'll do is I mean, we'll just go through a, a design phase where we say, hey, based upon your, your requirements for your, your technology, based upon your space, here's what we recommend. Um, the fact that we carry just about every brand, I'm, not, I'm very agnostic when it comes to what we sell you. So our goal, quite frankly, is at the end of the day to fit you into something that you actually need. Um, and we're gonna give you, you know, lots of experience behind it. And, um, and, and you know, it's, that's our process. You know, we're not gonna say one system's better than the other. We're gonna go through the whole process and, and hopefully design a simulator that best fits your needs. Um, but more importantly, in most cases, not only fits your needs, but also fits your budget. Um, we've got a few questions here that have come in. Uh, one is, I've seen some screens with a thin fabric layer in front of a rear screen, which looks good, but seems to wear out more quickly. What are your thoughts on those? Yeah, so that, those are actually, ours so so basically what you're seeing is you're seeing a heavy duty rear mesh um we use a two-piece screen in almost all of our installations this one right here is it happens to be a single piece um and what we do is we actually velcro that material you're talking about is actually called trapeze um it's very stretchy back in the day that i mean that's just that's been around for a long time but the the one downfall of that is when, it, when it's new it looks fantastic sharp image fantastic over the course of time, as you hit the golf ball, you know, hundreds and thousands of times, it starts drooping. So that stretchy material, while good at the beginning, will start drooping towards towards the end. It is a cheaper material. Um, nowadays, for most of our home installs and almost all of our commercial installs, we still use that rear mesh screen because that thing will last years, even in a commercial environment. And what we do is we use this material right now, the three ply to actually put it on top of it. Uh, and then the only thing, the only thing you get with this material right now is you get burn marks. Um, so we, a lot of them, it's, it's, a, it's a film that they used for FR ratings. Um, it also gives a little bit of sheen. Most of these three plies, you'll see one, one edge, one side is kind of a little dull and the other side is real shiny. So that real shiny has a film on it. And as the golf ball with all those RPMs hits the ball, it's there for that couple milliseconds. And what it does is actually that RPM actually burns a mark in that ball. That's why you see kind of ball marks on these screens nowadays. You know, related to that, Jay, I'd be curious. I've got a number of questions over the years about uh, having to mark balls and, you know, folks maybe not wanting to buy the stickers, having experience that if they mark the ball with the Sharpie, the Sharpie can bleed onto the screen. Uh, for those who have simulators that work better with a marked ball, what recommendations do you have for them? So, buy the marked balls from the from the from the manufacturer. I mean, simple as that. So those having come from a ball golf and the marked balls, those things are imprinted on at the time of making of the golf ball. Um, it's like Titleist logo on a Titleist ball that does not wear. Um, so whether it's the QED from Unicor. Um, obviously the RCT balls from the radar base are fine, but that's internally, sometimes they put the metal sticker on, but that actually, that metal sticker will actually rip the screen over time. Um, about golf uses marked balls. If you're going to do it, d those patterns allow the cameras to actually measure the, the direct spin of the golf ball, which is important and, and the accuracy. There's really no way to replicate it. Um, so I would never, ever, ever recommend using a Sharpie to kind of replicate those marks. Uh, that, that Sharpie, no matter how long ago you put it on, will come off on the screen. Um, it's not a permanent, it's not permanent to the golf ball and it will come off. And so when you see, you know, blue marks, black marks, red marks, that Sharpie does come off. So I would recommend, um, 
whether it's your residential sim, whether it's commercial sim, never use Sharpie marks. Make sure that and then make sure the balls are, are clean. Because um, that's that's those are the two quickest ways to mark up a, a screen. As far as you know, you know, another important thing is no nicks. So if you have a commercial facility or your own home, make sure you pay attention to the golf balls. Those nicks are like a razor's edge to these to these golf screens. It will wear them out much quicker. Thanks. Are the basic packages associated with the launch monitors, the ones that come with the monitors, sufficient? Often they have premium packages that cost more. In your experience, do the premium packages do that much more for you, whether it's, I guess, the analytics packages or um, more courses, more features, things like that? That's strictly money-based. It's hard I mean, to answer the worth it question, it, it, right? It, depend, it really depends on your budget. I mean, I have done many, many sim layers where they get the base package if it's a budget concern. Almost all the, the premium courses, I mean, those are all add-ons that you can add. It's just the software. It's, it's you know, it's literally a download of software or it's a turn on the license, like, you know, like club data for, for Foresight, for example. Um, it's a matter. It's a matter of just in your. They just flick a switch and the license, and, and and it's on. So that's strictly a budgetary purpose. Um, you know, I do love the premium courses, but there are premium. There are a lot of courses out there to choose from. And you know, I mean, obviously, if you get GS Pro and stuff like that, I mean, it kind of comes with them. Um, like the the E sixes of the world, the four sites of the world, the about golfs of the world, full swings of the world. They do make you pay for premium courses. If, I, if I'm a home user, you know, depending on how much money I have, I may or may not get them. I will say that if you're in a commercial environment, um, they're absolutely necessary because those are the courses people want to play. Okay, that's what they want to come in and pay. You know, they want us, they want to play the courses that the pros are playing on TV. I think the next question goes back to some of the turf conversations. So do you attach the turf to the foam tiles or just lay it on top? I think that might be with your uh, tatami yeah, tile. Yeah, there's three different ways we do it. Um, so if the room, like if you walk in the room and, and you got four four walls, you can lay it on top. It's not moving. Um, if you have a wall where you're worried about sliding, you can either double side tape it or you know or we glue it. A lot of the times nowadays we'll actually glue the turf and then we'll double side carpet tape double the uh, the actual inlay for the hitting hitting mat area. Uh, but a lot of times we'll just sit here the turf. Thanks. A um, couple other questions. We don't have anything coming in right now, so I'll just put a few that I see on the forum from time to time. Um, folks ask a lot about used devices. Hey, I'm looking at this um, launch monitor. The price looks really good. What should I make sure I check out before I buy this this used uh, launch monitor? The only I mean, obviously you want to make sure it works. So, I mean, I, you're going to have to check out who's who's selling it. A lot of the OEMs nowadays will actually have uh, certified pre-owned. Um, if you're worried about it, I'd, I'd recommend that if, it, if you're worried about who's selling it to you. The other thing to look out for is re-registration fees where someone will ding you for, you know, somebody buys it, they'll transfer a license over to you as a, as a new owner and sometimes they'll actually charge a re-registration fee. So those are the things you have to look out for. Um, but as far as functionality of the systems, that's, I mean, it's a crapshoot if you don't know the owner. Just like any, any, a car, anything is a crapshoot if you don't know who you're, who you're buying it from. The one that I uh, see that I, I actually think is kind of funny is, uh, what's, what are some of the best arguments you've heard for folks trying to convince their spouse that they should be able to put a golf simulator in their home? All right. So I've run into this numerous times. Where I get to the point where some one of them wants a golf sim layer, usually the guy. Um, he um, most of the time the, the spouse is on board. So how I normally get around it, um, depending on the scenario, you know, I've, I've run into it where if you're going to do a home, you're going to do a nice screen uh, with a nice projector, especially in today's world. I mean, it's it's a computer. It's a projector and it's a screen. Okay, it's essentially a TV. That's what it boils down to. So it, they make great movie theaters. You get a good screen system, it makes a great movie theater. 
you know, the computer, you got Netflix, you got Prime, you can hook up cable. Um, all that goes to the projector, and next thing you know, you're watching you're watching a movie. You know, you hook up a soundbar or something, and the next thing you know, you got a home theater. Um, the other thing that I've, I've run into is people with kids. Um, dad wants it, but the kids are up and coming. And one of the arguments I make, especially when you get a kid that's better and it's really dedicated to the game, it's got a chance to go to college. And and if that's the case that simulator is going to be much cheaper than a four-year degree because there's a lot of open scholarships not, might not be a division one school but there's some division twos and division threes that do have golf scholarships that um you know if you have a kid and, and that i've i've used that many times and it actually works so but the home theater one is actually the one that works the most cool um getting a few more it's not released yet but any thoughts on the unique or um mini compared to the say bushnell launch pros so it's not been out yet. That's going to be it's going to be released here shortly. We'll have some some units here within the next hopefully within the next month or two. Um, the one thing I'll say about Unicor is is it, it been in the business so long. A lot of the Asian companies come over here. They're a flash in the pan. Meaning we were at the PGA Merchandise Show in January. They're here one year, not the next. Um, Unicor has been here for years. They're well established. Um, they're actually a publicly traded company over in Korea, so they got a lot of money behind them. And quite frankly, I expect it to be good. You know, okay. their products are solid. Um, I install a ton of them, and uh, their price points are good. Uh, so I, I expect it to be good. I've just seen it at the PGA show. It's accurate. It's got great functionality. Um, they're always coming out with improvements. I mean, they got the IXO2 coming out. So within the last four or five years since they've been around, they've had the QED, they've had the IXO, they have their own integrated camera system, they now have a weight transfer, you know, basically a balance mat. Um, they have the IXO2, now they have um, the Mini coming out and they've made improvements in their software. So within a short period of time, they're continuing to improve, uh, not only software, but also hardware. They're coming out with a, multiple different uses of, of the technologies and the game game improvement uh, the new refined software the new short game is great so all in all it's a pretty darn good company solid product at a pretty darn good price great we've had a few more come in we're getting close to the top of the hour so i might cap it at this and ask folks to uh, we'll wait and get some instructions on anything you didn't get answered. Um, can you discuss putting? You know, talk about um, you know putting on simulators. What's the best turf? Um, you know, where where can you put them? That kind of thing. Well, that's a pretty general question. So, um, so most of the putting takes place within the first twelve to sixteen inches of the of the of the strike. Um, Putting is obviously, as most people probably know on this forum, is um, this webinar is the hardest thing to get used to in the golf simulator. And um, depending on if it's an overhead camera, if it's side mount, if it's radar base, most of them all have putting. Um, the only thing I'll say on putting is it just takes time to get used to. Um, one of the things I, we're, you know, so we try to do a flat floor so it doesn't affect it at all. Um, the turf I use, we get commercial grade turf right from the mills in Dalton, Georgia. Um, they run about a 10 to 10 and a half on the stint meter. So they're pretty, pretty accurate. We've done a lot of putting greens as well. Integrate putting greens and a golf similar, pretty cool product. Um, but you know, it, it doesn't take a lot of depth for the, for the technology to actually get speed and in direction is really all they need, all they need to look at. And then it, and it just you know goes on the screen so a lot of people have trouble with the speed it's got really nothing to do with the turf um how to you know how to read downhill uphill and then anything that's beyond like 10 feet where your screen is a 20 or 30 foot putt it's just touch you know the stem the stems on the software can be changed the green firmness can be changed so putting is tricky but I can tell you within a, a handful of rounds of your simulator, you'll get you'll get pretty used to it. Uh, so I got a question about the bungees. Um, on the edge of the screen, there are bungees with metal hooks and bungees with 
rigid plastic like describe a little bit about what you look for in a bungee where you were showing us the display at the beginning of what you use yeah, so, on the, the screen so i use bungee cables bungee cords with these with these metal hooks with the angle irons it hooks right in the angle iron some people use uni strut with uh, like little eyelets if you have a emt galvanized pipe inch and a half inch whatever you have um, we use 80 20 engineered aluminum in our our frame systems it's extremely solid um people use what they call ball bungees so you just wrap it and it's a it's like a ball and then you just wrap the cord around the ball um and it doesn't actually stick to anything it just it's just meant to go through through the grommet another reason why we use number four grommets which are bigger than you know a lot of people use number ones or number twos and then you'll just insert the cable wrap it around the post and then just basically stamp the ball bungee into place um Obviously, you got nothing to hook into if you have uh, if you don't have angle iron. So that's why people use uh, either the ball bungees or these these ones you you see here. Gotcha. Um, let's see. Last question: Are you um, do you sell to Canadian customers? We do. Yeah. We actually Canada. I actually sell pretty much all over. I'm actually having the Dominican Republic and made to install a few down there. So um, it's uh, but can, can, yeah, can, Canadian customers we get quite a few of them. The only thing that we can't sell there is is really foresight technology, screens, mats, turfs, enclosures, everything we can sell up there. But foresight has a exclusive um, partnership with uh, with Aaron Hardy up in uh, up in uh, Canada. Gotcha. Maybe I'll wrap it up with one last question. The one thing that we didn't touch on too much was you know anything around PC specs. Like, what do you recommend from a, a PC spec for folks who are trying to run a, a simulator at home? That's an awesome question. Um, so always overspec the computer, always. With the upgrades in the in the technology, you know, the an i7 13th generation processor is fine. You use 16 to 32 gig of RAM is typically fine, but the the graphics card, I mean, all these are graphics intensive. So I would recommend a 3000 series graphics card or above. I think right now in our kind of high level machines. That we run with uh, like Foresight and and E6 Connects, um, we're running 4,000 series uh, NVIDIA graphics cards. So always make sure you look at the specs, GS Pro, whatever software you want, and then and then go above and beyond. Awesome. Well, Joe, this was just fantastic. Um, <laughs> I love the uh, form. I appreciate everything, the breadth and depth that you're able to go. Um, I'll give you one last, you know, any parting shots or anything that you'd like to share before we finish the call today? Like again, guys, I appreciate y'all being here. Um, this is this, These are the things I've learned over the course of the last 18 years. There's obviously multiple ways of doing things. Um, Ace and our golf is here to help. Again, we represent multiple products, so we can always fit you into something that you're going to you're gonna like and you're, it's always going to be within your budget. So. You know, just give us a call, let us consult with you, go through the process, and then and then we'll just go from there. You know, Great. so we, we've installed a, a lot of sim layers over the years. Absolutely. Thanks. I appreciate it. Uh, and like I said, we'll we'll shoot a, I think there's an email that'll go out um, to everybody afterwards. We're going to, in that email, uh, post the link to where we're going to be sharing the video. Uh, if you want to look now, it'll probably take a couple of days, but on Reddit, there's a, um, what they call a subreddit, which is essentially a forum on golf simulators. So if you just go to Reddit and look up golf simulators, you'll see the forum. There's about 17,000 folks out there that are DIY uh, enthusiasts that share their builds, ask questions, answer questions, um, and just engage generally about the topic. So thanks everybody for joining us. I hope everybody has a great evening um, and, and hopefully we'll be able to do one of these again sometime. Cool. Thank you. Thanks, Reed. Thanks everyone. All right, take care.